This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Carl Manchester, 2007. God and the State by Mikhail Bakunin. Chapter 2, Part 2. The state will no longer call itself monarchy. It will call itself republic. But it will be nonetheless the state, that is, a tutelage officially and regularly established by a minority of competent men, men of virtuous genius or talent, who will watch and guide the conduct of this great, incorrigible and terrible child, the people. The professors of the school and the functionaries of the state will call themselves republicans, but they will be, none the less, tutors, shepherds, and the people will remain what they have been hitherto from all eternity, a flock. Beware of shearers, for where there is a flock, there necessarily must be shepherds also, to shear and devour it. The people in this system will be the perpetual scholar and pupil. In spite of its sovereignty, wholly fictitious, it will continue to serve as the instrument of thoughts, wills, and consequently interests not its own. Between this situation and what we call liberty, the only real liberty, there is an abyss. It will be the old oppression and old slavery under new forms, and where there is slavery, there is misery, brutishness, real social materialism among the privileged classes as well as among the masses. In defying human things, the idealists always end in the triumph of a brutal materialism. And this for a very simple reason. The divine evaporates and rises to its own country, heaven, while the brutal alone remains actually on earth. Yes, the necessary consequence of theoretical idealism is practically the most brutal materialism, not undoubtedly among those who sincerely preach it, the usual result as far as they are concerned being that they are constrained to see all their efforts struck with sterility. But among those who try to realise their precepts in life and in all society so far as it allows itself to be dominated by idealistic doctrines. To demonstrate this general fact, which may appear strange at first, but which explains itself naturally enough upon further reflection, historical proofs are not lacking. Compare the last two civilizations of the ancient world, the Greek and the Roman. Which is the most materialistic, the most natural in its point of departure, and the most humanly ideal in its results? Undoubtedly the Greek civilization. Which, on the contrary, is the most abstractly ideal in its point of departure, sacrificing the material liberty of the man to the ideal liberty of the citizen, represented by the abstraction of judicial law, and the natural development of human society to the abstraction of the state, and which became nevertheless the most brutal in its consequences? The Roman civilization, certainly. It is true that the Greek civilization, like all the ancient civilizations, including that of Rome, was exclusively national and based on slavery. But in spite of these two immense defects, the former nonetheless conceived and realized the idea of humanity. It ennobled and really idealized the life of men, it transformed human herds into free associations of free men. It created, through liberty, the sciences, the arts, a poetry, an immortal philosophy, and the primary concepts of human respect. With political and social liberty, it created free thought. At the close of the Middle Ages, during the period of the Renaissance, the fact that some Greek emigrants brought a few of those immortal books into Italy sufficed to resuscitate life, liberty, thought, humanity, buried in the dark dungeon of Catholicism. Human emancipation, that is the name of the Greek civilization. And the name of the Roman civilization? Conquest, with all its brutal consequences. And its last word? The omnipotence of the Caesars, which means the degradation and enslavement of nations and of men. Today even, what is it that kills, what is it that crushes brutally, materially, in all European countries, liberty and humanity? 
it is the triumph of the Caesarian or Roman principle. Compare now two modern civilizations, the Italian and the German. The first undoubtedly represents in its general character materialism. The second, on the contrary, represents idealism in the most abstract, most pure and most transcendental form. Let us see what are the practical fruits of the one and the other. Italy has already rendered immense services to the cause of human emancipation. She was the first to resuscitate and widely apply the principle of liberty in Europe and to restore to humanity its titles to nobility. Industry, commerce, poetry, the arts, the positive sciences and free thought. Crushed since by three centuries of imperial and papal despotism and dragged in the mud by her governing bourgeoisie, she reappears today, it is true, in a very degraded condition in comparison with what she once was. And yet how much she differs from Germany. In Italy, in spite of this decline, temporary, let us hope, one may live and breathe humanly, surrounded by a people which seems to be born for liberty. Italy, even bourgeois Italy, can point with pride to men like Mazzini and Garibaldi, in Germany, one breathes the atmosphere of an immense political and social slavery, philosophically explained and accepted by a great people with deliberate resignation and free will. Her heroes, I speak always of present Germany, not of the Germany of the future, of aristocratic, bureaucratic, political and bourgeoisie Germany, not of the Germany of the proletaires, her heroes are quite the opposite of Mazzini and Garibaldi. They are William I, that ferocious and ingenious representative of the Protestant God, Messrs Bismarck and Moltke, Generals Manteuffel and Werder. In all her international relations, Germany, from the beginning of her existence, has been slowly, systematically invading, conquering, ever ready to extend her own voluntary enslavement into the territory of her neighbours. And since her definitive establishment as a unitary power, she has become a menace, a danger to the liberty of entire Europe. Today, Germany is civility, brutal and triumphant. To show how theoretical idealism incessantly and inevitably changes into practical materialism, one needs only to cite the example of all the Christian churches, and naturally, first of all, that of the Apostolic and Roman Church. What is there more sublime in the ideal sense, more disinterested, more separate from all the interests of this earth, than the doctrine of Christ preached by that church? And what is there more brutally materialistic than the constant practice of that same church since the 8th century, from which dates her definitive establishment as a power? What has been, and still is, the principal object of all her contests with the sovereigns of Europe? Her temporal goods, her revenues first, and then her temporal power, her political privileges. We must do her the justice to acknowledge that she was the first to discover in modern history this incontestable but scarcely Christian truth that wealth and power, the economic exploitation and the political oppression of the masses, are the two inseparable terms of the reign of divine ideality on earth. Wealth consolidating and augmenting power, power ever discovering and creating new sources of wealth, and both assuring, better than the martyrdom and faith of the apostles, better than divine grace, the success of the Christian propagandism. This is a historical truth, and the Protestant churches do not fail to recognise it either. I speak, of course, of the independent churches of England, America and Switzerland, not of the subjected churches of Germany. The latter have no initiative of their own. They do what their masters, their temporal sovereigns, who are at the same time their spiritual chieftains, order them to do. It is well known that the Protestant propagandism especially in England and America, is very intimately connected with the propagandism of the material, commercial interests of those two great nations. And it is also known that the objects of the latter propagandism is not at all the enrichment and material prosperity of the countries into which it penetrates in company with the word of God, but rather the exploitation of those countries with a view to the enrichment and material prosperity of certain classes, which, in their own country, are very covetous and very pious at the same time. In a word, it is not at all difficult to prove, history in hand, that the Church, that all the Churches, Christian and non-Christian, 
by the side of their spiritualistic propagandism, and probably to accelerate and consolidate the success thereof, have never neglected to organise themselves into great corporations for the economic exploitation of the masses, under the protection and with the direct and special blessing of some divinity or other, that all the states, which originally, as we know, with all their political and judicial institutions and their dominant and privileged classes, have been only temporal branches of these various churches, have likewise had principally in view this same exploitation for the benefit of lay minorities indirectly sanctioned by the church. Finally, and in general, that the action of the good God and of all the divine idealities on earth has ended at last, always and everywhere, in founding the prosperous materialism of the few over the fanatical and constantly famishing idealism of the masses. We have a new proof of this in what we see today. With the exception of the great hearts and great minds whom I have before referred to as misled, who are today the most obstinate defenders of idealism? In the first places, all the sovereign courts. In France, until lately, Napoleon III and his wife, Madame Eugénie, all their former ministers, courtiers and ex-marshals, from Rouen and Bazaine to Fleury and Pietri, the men and women of this imperial world who have so completely idealised and saved France, their journalists and their savants, the Girardins, the Duvernois, the Veillot, the Le Verrier, the Dumas, the black phalanx of Jesuits and Jesuitesses in every garb, the whole upper and middle bourgeoisie of France, the doctrinaire liberals and the liberals without doctrine, the Guizot, the Thiers, the Jules Favre, the Pelletin and the Jules Simon, all obstinate defenders of the bourgeoisie exploitation. In Prussia, in Germany, William I, the present royal demonstrator of the good God on earth, all his generals, all his officers, Pomeranian and other, all his army, which, strong in its religious faith, has just conquered France in that ideal way we know so well. In Russia, the Tsar and his court, the Moraviefs and the Bergs, all the butchers and pious proselytizers of Poland. Everywhere, in short, religious or philosophical idealism, the one being but the more or less free translation of the other, serves today as the flag of material, bloody and brutal force, of shameless material exploitation, while on the contrary, the flag of theoretical materialism, the red flag of economic equality and social justice, is raised by the practical idealism of the oppressed and famishing masses. Tending to realise the greatest liberty and the human right of each in the fraternity of all men on the earth. Who are the real idealists? The idealists not of abstraction but of life, not of heaven but of earth. And who are the materialists? It is evident that the essential condition of theoretical or divine idealism is the sacrifice of logic, of human reason, the renunciation of science. We see further that in defending the doctrines of idealism, one finds himself enlisted perforce in the ranks of the oppressors and exploiters of the masses. These are two great reasons which, it would seem, should be sufficient to drive every great mind, every great heart, from idealism. How does it happen that our illustrious contemporary idealists, who certainly lack neither mind nor heart nor goodwill, and who have devoted their entire existence to the service of humanity, how does it happen that they persist in remaining among the representatives of a doctrine henceforth condemned and dishonoured? They must be influenced by a very powerful motive. It cannot be logic or science, since logic and science have pronounced their verdict against the idealistic doctrine. No more can it be personal interests, since these men are infinitely above everything of that sort. It must then be a powerful moral motive. Which? There can be but one. These illustrious men think, no doubt, that idealistic theories or beliefs are essentially necessary to the moral dignity and grandeur of man and that materialistic theories, on the contrary, reduce him to the level of the beasts. And if the truth were just the opposite. Every development, I have said, implies the negation of its point of departure. The basis or point of departure, according to the materialistic school, being material, the negation must be necessarily ideal. 
starting from the totality of the real world, or from what is abstractly called matter, it logically arrives at the real idealization, that is, at the humanization, at the full and complete emancipation of society. Per contra, and for the same reason, the basis and point of departure of the idealistic school being ideal, it arrives necessarily at the materialization of society, at the organization of a brutal despotism and an iniquitous and ignoble exploitation under the form of church and state. The historical development of man according to the materialistic school is a progressive ascension. In the idealistic system it can be nothing but a continuous fall. Whatever human question we may desire to consider, we always find this same essential contradiction between the two schools. Thus, as I have already observed, materialism starts from animality to establish humanity. Idealism starts from divinity to establish slavery and condemn the masses to an endless animality. Materialism denies free will and ends in the establishment of liberty. Idealism, in the name of human dignity, proclaims free will, and on the ruins of every liberty founds authority. Materialism rejects the principle of authority, because it rightly considers it as the corollary of animality, and because, on the contrary, the triumphs of humanity, the object and chief significance of history, can be realised only through liberty. In a word, you will always find the idealists in the very act of practical materialism. Whilst you will see the materialists pursuing and realising the most grandly ideal aspirations and thoughts. History, in the system of the idealists, as I have said, can be nothing but a continuous fall. They begin by a terrible fall, from which they never recover, by the salto mortale, from the sublime regions of pure and absolute idea into matter. And into what kind of matter? Not into the matter which is eternally active and mobile, full of properties and forces, of life and intelligence, as we see it in the real world, but into abstract matter, impoverished and reduced to absolute misery by the regular looting of these Prussians of thought, the theologians and metaphysicians, who have stripped it of everything to give everything to their emperor, to their god. Into the matter which, deprived of all action and movement of its own, represents, in opposition to the divine idea, nothing but absolute stupidity, impenetrability, inertia and immobility. The fall is so terrible that divinity, the divine person or idea, is flattened out, loses consciousness of itself and never more recovers it. And in this desperate situation it is still forced to work miracles. For from the moment that matter becomes inert, every movement that takes place in the world, even the most material, is a miracle can result only from a providential intervention, from the action of God upon matter. And there this poor divinity, degraded and half annihilated by its fall, lies some thousands of centuries in this swoon, then awakens slowly, in vain endeavouring to grasp some vague memory of itself, and every move that it makes in this direction upon matter becomes a creation, a new formation, a new miracle. In this way, it passes through all degrees of materiality and bestiality. First gas, simple or compound chemical substance, mineral, it then spreads over the earth as vegetable and animal organisation till it concentrates itself in man. Here it would seem as if it must become itself again, for it lights in every human being an angelic spark, a particle of its own divine being, the immortal soul. How did it manage to lodge a thing absolutely immaterial in a thing absolutely material? How can the body contain, enclose, limit, paralyse pure spirit? This, again, is one of those questions which faith alone, that passionate and stupid affirmation of the absurd, can solve. It is the greatest of miracles. Here, however, we have only to establish the effects, the practical consequences, of this miracle. After thousands of centuries of vain efforts to come back to itself, divinity, lost and scattered in the matter which it animates and sets in motion, finds a point of support, a sort of focus for self-concentration. This focus is man, his immortal soul singularly imprisoned in a mortal body. But each man considered individually is infinitely too limited, too small, to enclose the divine immensity. It can contain only a very small particle, immortal like the whole, 
but infinitely smaller than the whole. It follows that the divine being, the absolutely immaterial being, mind, is divisible like matter. Another mystery whose solution must be left to faith. If God entire could find lodgment in each man, then each man would be God. We should have an immense quantity of gods, each limited by all the others and yet none the less infinite, a contradiction which would imply a mutual destruction of men, an impossibility of the existence of more than one. As for the particles, that is another matter. Nothing more rational indeed than that one particle should be limited by another and be smaller than the whole. Only here another contradiction confronts us. To be limited, to be greater and smaller, are attributes of matter, not of mind. According to the materialists, it is true, mind is only the working of the holy material organism of man, and the greatness or smallness of mind depends absolutely on the greater or less material perfection of the human organism. But these same attributes of relative limitation and grandeur cannot be attributed to mind as the idealists conceive it. Absolutely immaterial mind, mind existing independent of matter. There can be neither greater nor smaller nor any limit amongst minds, for there is only one mind, God. To add that the infinitely small and limited particles which constitute human souls are at the same time immortal is to carry the contradiction to a climax. But this is a question of faith. Let us pass on. Here then we have divinity torn up and lodged in infinitely small particles in an immense number of beings of all sexes, ages, races and colours. This is an excessively inconvenient and unhappy situation. For the divine particles are so little acquainted with each other at the outset of their human existence that they begin by devouring each other. Moreover, in the midst of this state of barbarism and holy animal brutality, these divine particles, human souls, retain, as it were, a vague remembrance of their primitive divinity and are irresistibly drawn towards their whole. They seek each other. They seek their whole. It is divinity itself, scattered and lost in the natural world, which looks for itself in men, and it is so demolished by this multitude of human prisons in which it finds itself strewn that, in looking for itself, it commits folly after folly. Beginning with fetishism, it searches for and adores itself, now in a stone, now in a piece of wood, now in a rag. It is quite likely that it would never have succeeded in getting out of the rag if the other, divinity which was not allowed to fall into matter and which is kept in a state of pure spirit in the sublime heights of the absolute ideal or in the celestial regions had not had pity on it here is a new mystery that of divinity dividing itself into two halves both equally infinite of which one god the father stays in the purely immaterial regions and the other god the son falls into matter we shall see directly between these two divinities, separated from each other, continuous relations established from above to below and from below to above. And these relations, considered as a single eternal and constant act, will constitute the Holy Ghost. Such, in its veritable theological and metaphysical meaning, is the great, the terrible, mystery of the Christian Trinity. But let us lose no time in abandoning these heights to see what is going on upon earth. God the Father, seeing from the height of his eternal splendour that the poor God the Son, flattened out and astounded by his fall, is so plunged and lost in matter that even having reached the human state he has not yet recovered himself, decides to come to his aid. From this immense number of particles at once immortal, divine and infinitely small, in which God the Son has disseminated himself so thoroughly that he does not know himself, God the Father chooses those most pleasing to him, picks his inspired persons, his prophets, his men of virtuous genius, the great benefactors and legislators of humanity, Zoroaster, Buddha, Moses, Confucius, Lycurgus, Solon, Socrates, the divine Plato, and above all, Jesus Christ, the complete realization of God the Son, at last collected and concentrated in a single human person, all the apostles, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John before all, Constantine the Great, Mohammed, then Charlemagne, Gregory the Seventh, Dante, and according to some, Luther also, Voltaire and Rousseau, Robespierre and Danton, 
and many other great holy historical personages, all of whose names it is impossible to recapitulate, but among whom I, as a Russian, beg that St. Nicholas may not be forgotten. Then we have reached at last the manifestation of God upon earth, but immediately God appears, man is reduced to nothing. It will be said that he is not reduced to nothing, since he is himself a particle of God. Pardon me. I admit that a particle of a definite limited whole, however small it be, is a quantity, a positive greatness. But a particle of the infinitely great, compared with it, is necessarily infinitely small. Multiply milliards of milliards by milliards of milliards, their product, compared to the infinitely great, will be infinitely small, and the infinitely small is equal to zero. God is everything, therefore man and the real world with him, the universe, are nothing. You will not escape this conclusion. God appears, man is reduced to nothing, and the greater divinity becomes, the more miserable becomes humanity. That is the history of all religions. That is the effect of all the divine inspirations and legislations. In history the name of God is the terrible club with which all divinely inspired men, the great virtuous geniuses, have beaten down the liberty, dignity, reason and prosperity of man. We had first the fall of God. Now we have a fall which interests us more, that of man, caused solely by the apparition of God manifested on earth. See in how profound an error our dear and illustrious idealists find themselves. In talking to us of God, they purpose, they desire, to elevate us, emancipate us, ennoble us, and, on the contrary, they crush and degrade us. With the name of God, they imagine that they can establish fraternity among men, and, on the contrary, they create pride, contempt, they sow discord, hatred, war. They establish slavery. For with God come the different degrees of divine inspiration. Humanity is divided into men highly inspired, less inspired, uninspired. All are equally insignificant before God, it is true, but compared with each other, some are greater than others. Not only in fact, which would be of no consequence, because inequality in fact is lost in the collectivity when it cannot cling to some legal fiction or institution, but by the divine right of inspiration, which immediately establishes a fixed, constant, petrifying inequality. The highly inspired must be listened to and obeyed by the less inspired, and the less inspired by the uninspired. Thus we have the principle of authority well established, and with it the two fundamental institutions of slavery, church and state. Of all despotisms, that of the doctrinaires, or inspired religionists, is the worst. They are so jealous of the glory of their God and of the triumph of their idea that they have no heart left for the liberty or the dignity or even the sufferings of living men, of real men. Divine zeal, preoccupation with the idea, finally dry up the tenderest souls, the most compassionate hearts, the sources of human love. Considering all that is, all that happens in the world from the point of view of eternity or of the abstract idea, they treat passing matters with disdain. But the whole life of real men, of men of flesh and bone, is composed only of passing matters. They themselves are only passing beings who once passed are replaced by others, likewise passing but never to return in person. Alone, permanent or relatively eternal in men is humanity, which, steadily developing, grows richer in passing from one generation to another. I say relatively eternal because our planet, once destroyed, it cannot fail to perish sooner or later, since everything which has begun must necessarily end. Our planet once decomposed, to serve undoubtedly as an element of some new formation in the system of the universe, which alone is really eternal, who knows what will become of our whole human development. Nevertheless, the moment of this dissolution being an enormous distance in the future, we may properly consider humanity, relatively to the short duration of human life, as eternal. But this very fact of progressive humanity is real and living only through its manifestation at definite times in definite places, in really living men, and not through its general idea. The general idea is always an abstraction, and, for that very reason, in some sort, a negation of real life. I have stated in the appendix that human thought and, in consequence of this, science, can grasp and name only the general significance of real facts. 
their relations, their laws. In short, that which is permanently in their continual transformations, but never their material, individual side, palpitating, so to speak, with reality and life, and therefore fugitive and intangible. Science comprehends the thought of the reality, not the reality itself, the thought of life, not life. That is its limit, its only really insuperable limit, because it is founded on the very nature of thought, which is the only organ of science. Upon this nature are based the indisputable rights and grand mission of science, but also its vital impotence and even its mischievous action whenever, through its official licensed representatives, it arrogantly claims the right to govern life. The mission of science is, by observation of the general relations of passing and real facts, to establish the general laws inherent in the development of the phenomena of the physical and social world. It fixes, so to speak, the unchangeable landmarks of humanity's progressive march by indicating the general conditions which it is necessary to rigorously observe and always fatal to ignore or forget. In a word, science is the compass of life, but it is not life itself. Science is unchangeable, impersonal, general, abstract, insensible, like the laws of which it is but the ideal reproduction, reflected or mental, that is, cerebral, using this word to remind us that science itself is but a material product of a material organ, the brain. Life is wholly fugitive and temporary, but also wholly palpitating with reality and individuality, sensibility, sufferings, joys, aspirations, needs and passions. It alone spontaneously creates real things and beings. Science creates nothing. It establishes and recognises only the creations of life. And every time that scientific men, emerging from their abstract world, mingle with living creation in the real world, all they propose or create is poor, ridiculously abstract, bloodless and lifeless, stillborn, like the homunculus created by Wagner, the pedantic disciple of the immortal Dr. Faust. It follows that the only mission of science is to enlighten life, not to govern it. The government of science and of men of science, even be they positivists, disciples of Auguste Comte, or again disciples of the doctrinaire school of German communism, cannot fail to be impotent, ridiculous, inhuman, cruel, oppressive, exploiting, maleficent. We may say of men of science as such what I have said of theologians and metaphysicians. They have neither sense nor heart for individual and living beings. We cannot blame them for this, for it is the natural consequence of their profession. In so far as they are men of science, they have to deal with and can take interest in nothing except generalities that do the laws. Editorial note. Three pages of the manuscript are missing. End note. They are not exclusively men of science, but are also more or less men of life. End of part two of chapter two. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.